Hey everyone, welcome to the Film Photography Podcast. My name's Trev Lee, and I'm gonna be your guest host today. Um, I've listened to the FPP podcast for, I mean, many years. I've been on it a few times, but I get the host at this time. It's the first time ever hosting any podcast, so uh, wish me luck. We have a good one. We have some great guests here. I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. Uh, we're all here before we go for a Columbus uh, meet up here in Ohio, but let's start off with Matt. Uh, yeah, I'm Matt Day. I'm from Chillicothe, Ohio, about 45 minutes to an hour south of here. And uh, yeah, like Trev, I've been seeing people like Mike for a long time on uh, on YouTube, long before I was ever on there. Known Mr. Mirage for a long time as well. Always good to have the darkroom guys. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Oh, hey, I'm Mike Rosso. <laughs> I'm the founder of the Film Photography Project, born and bred in New Jersey. We're still based in New Jersey, although we have amazing representation here in Ohio. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Matt Mirage. I've been eat, sleeping and breathing film photography for, oh my God, 15 years now. <clears throat> and with FPP, is that 13, Mike? Yeah, at least. Oh my gosh, yeah. we've been doing this a minute. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's it's weird getting older and like, you know, just more people keep jumping in. It's cool. Uh, my name is Phil Stebley. I'm one of the founders of The Dark Room in San Clemente, California. Uh, I've known all these guys for quite a long time. We were reminiscing that first met Mike and Matt uh, 12 years ago at an event in New York City. So uh, happy to be back with these guys. And I'm Keith Swan. I'm the other co-founder of The Dark Room. Uh, I live in San Clemente. And uh, I've been in the photo industry almost 45 years now, and I've known these guys for about 10 years now. Yes. And uh, thank you for having me. We're going to kick things off with Matt Day, who is a Ohio native. Uh, so it was like perfect to have him here since we're meeting in Ohio. We're 45 minutes north of where you're from in Chillicothe, right? Yep. Yep. Just uh, directly north of Chillicothe. And, yeah. So I wanted to kick it off. We talked with you a week ago, and we talked about your book, which is coming out soon. Um, is the pre-order? It's done now, right? Are you still? Yeah, yeah. The pre-order. I went ahead and closed uh, all of the books. Are currently on their way. They should arrive at my house, probably in about five-ish days. I would imagine they'd be in by then, and uh, then the long process starts of signing, packing boxing everything up, getting everything out the door. Uh, I'm going to ship out all of the pre-orders first, get those out, you know, uh, next week, hopefully I'll be able to get all the pre-orders out. And then after that, I'll open the, the site back up and have the rest of them available to purchase there. So all, all self-published it's yeah, got my hands full. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you, I know that you shot that with a Pentax six, seven. I don't think I ever asked you what lens, and we talked about what yeah. film. So go into why the Pentax 6.7, what lens, and the three different film stocks that you were shooting with. The previous book that I did before that was all black and white, uh, 35 millimeter. It was all Tri-X. And then uh, this next book, I knew I wanted to shoot medium format. Just, I think, in the time that had passed, I had shot more and more medium format and... Uh, for printing especially. I wanted to have something a little bit bigger, not a 4x5 shooter. I've tried a few different times and it's just not the speed for me. Um, so 6x7 has always been one of my favorite formats and just aspect ratios to actually frame things up. So picked up the 672 mostly for just the convenience of using it. It's just a big SLR. Um, and I carried it with me everywhere I went for a little over a year. Normally I have a 35 millimeter that I always carry after lugging it around literally, literally everywhere for over a year. As soon as I finished shooting for the project, I was, I was done with it and ready to move on to something different. But, um, I used that honestly, a, a big portion of that was for the lenses. And one of them was the 75 F 2.8 AL, um, I had a 75 millimeter f4.5 before that, and I like that field of view on 6x7, but the 2.8 AL, you can focus so much closer with that lens. And obviously the extra, mm. you know, 
over stop over an extra stop of light. And but that's a thirty five millimeter equivalent too. Yeah, right? yeah. Which is your favorite. It's what I, it's what I'm used to shooting, um, and being able to focus a little bit closer, get a brighter viewfinder as well. Uh, it was a lens I'd always wanted, and so I knew I was going to be focusing on this book. Um, yeah, that's how I landed basically on that camera, and I would say probably 95% of the photos, if not more, was all with that one lens. And then the film, it was FP4, HP5, and Delta 3200. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Typically, I like to keep things way more consistent and just stick to one film, one lens. Um, I've probably, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I've shot anything other than HP5 in my M6 over the last 10 years. Uh, well, I guess first it was Tri-X, but since I switched over to HP5, uh, probably around nine years, nine years ago, um, that's really all I ever shoot. But for this one, I was shooting in a lot of different lighting scenarios. Uh, some stuff early in the morning or late at night. Some stuff was in the middle of the day. Um, and I didn't develop anything until about six to eight months when I was working on it. I just kind of trusted my gut. And the longer the time went on, I started kind of wondering like, this might not all work <laughs> well together as much as I'd like it to, considering I was shooting, you know, a few different stocks there. But um, once I got everything scanned in, uh, it, it all felt, you know, perfectly fine next to each other. I think I worried about stuff like that a lot more than I really needed to. I'm interested in seeing those, uh, the photos side by side, because I know, I assume you're not going to like say this is that or that is this. Yeah, yeah, and no. I feel like that. that'll be perfect because everyone knows, most people know what HP5 looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the more underrated Ilford film stocks is FP4, yeah. which is 125 ISO. And a lot of people associate that with like a really fine grain, which it is relatively fine, uh, but it still has a little bit of you can see it compared yeah. to like Delta 100, which is clinically really smooth. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like it'll be cool to see those two. Then obviously Delta 3200 isn't lacking in character when it comes right. to like the green. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Matt, uh, my sincere congratulations on th these projects. Thank you. For anyone listening or, or, or viewing, it's like, I, I don't take any of these, this for granted because when you talk about like a book project, like the amount of discipline involved with, you know, a project like this with your day-to-day -day life yeah. is incredible. I appreciate that. And Thank you. Trev, what you're saying about like the comparisons, I think is amazingly interesting because for folks at home, it's like, you're, you're going to see Matt's book, but in your mind, you're thinking, I mean, what stock is this? Is yeah. this HP5? So you almost want to see, you almost want to know what the, they are so you can compare yeah. the, the shots, which I think is great. Yeah, I think, I mean, Delta 3200 is... Th that one I feel like is going to be a pretty easy giveaway, um, especially like I, I shot a lot of that again early in the morning, late at night, because um, I, I really like that film in those so kind of conditions. Um, and it fit kind of certain areas of the book and the things I was shooting. Um, but I would be interested to see someone sit down with all the pictures and try to actually yeah try and see if people can guess <laughs> honestly i will have to go back to my negatives to look at times because i'm like that looks like hp5 but it could have been you know fp4 or, um a couple of them i remember specifically but yeah when Matt, you, oh Matt, let me ask, when you you're compiling your book do you do much cropping um, there were a couple of them. Yeah. A couple of them where I like, for instance, if I left the house and I only had the 75, I didn't bring the 105 with me. Those were really the only two lenses, uh, that I owned during all of that. Um, there would be times where I left the house only had the 75, but I really wanted something a little bit tighter. Um, I would crop then after the scan, but, um, yeah, that, that's one thing I like about that 75 was being able to focus closer than I even would with the 105. So, uh, but yeah, I, I have no, no issues with cropping or anything like that, especially with a negative that big. Right. Yeah. Did you literally have a camera with you day and night? Like wherever, wherever you everywhere. Went? Yeah. Everywhere. I mean, dropping the kids off at school in the morning, it would be in the passenger seat next to me just right. in case. Cause most of the time I don't really have time it's very rare that i go out just with the intention of taking pictures right. usually it's 
a random thing that I see or come across just going through sort of day to day. Matt, I've seen you probably 20 times over the years and I've never seen you without. <laughs> yeah, that's the only way I can still take pictures is if I just always have one with me. Yeah. What's the title of your latest book? Uh, it's called Surveyor. Okay. Yeah, Surveyor. So um, Is it truly sold out like someone? Can't... No, no, it's oh, no, okay. it's pre-orders. only the pre-orders. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So so after I I had the pre-orders up for uh, it was probably a couple of months, I think. I went ahead and closed the pre-orders once I knew the books were on their way. So that way, as I'm fulfilling orders, there aren't more orders coming in. I knew it would make my life a lot easier to just have a specific amount that as soon as the books get in, get those out and fulfilled. Um, and just to give the people who did pre-order, kind of give them the first opportunity. Can we to buy see them? Right from your website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all sold on my website. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not sold out by any means. Uh, once I get all the pre-orders shipped out, um, I'd say there's a little under two-thirds of the amount of copies still available after that. So, still plenty of time. So, one thing I think it would be good for people, like, listening, and a lot of people, like, it's especially if you're new to film, you know, you have FP4, which is 125 HP 5, 400, Delta 3200, 3200 ISO. So very different when it comes to ISO. Mm -hmm. How do you go about choosing? I think since we will shoot it, it might be obvious like, oh, Delta 3200 low light. But it's, do you ever change yeah. that? Do you ever change it up if you're still on the road? Like, did, you, did any of your Delta 3200 shots make it in that were daylight? Yes, yes, um, yeah. But yeah, going to how you... Um, like what you was going in, like what you would load. Yeah. Um, f for instance, if, if I was somewhere where I typically shoot Delta 3200 at 1600, yeah. um, just to give it a little bit more light. So if I, if I knew I was going to be needing a fast enough shutter speed to shoot handheld or something, cause I really don't like working on a tripod. It's a big reason why four by five just doesn't work for me. Um, being able to have a fast enough shutter speed to shoot handheld, that would kind of lean towards the Delta 3200. But with the 672, it's not a camera with, you know, interchangeable backs. So I couldn't just switch to something different. I would just finish the roll, you know. You so put 125 in, you're like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there, yeah. there, there were plenty of times. I, 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 yeah, that's the thing with FP4. I would know, okay, it's a bright, sunny day. Even if I'm in Got the it. shade, I'll be fine. Yeah. Um, Whereas, yeah, with the, the Delta 3200, if I was shooting during the day, if it was cloudy, I could make it work. Um, otherwise, I'd be, you know, stopping the lens down as far as I can and fast as I can. How low of a shutter speed do you hand hold at? Uh, with the 672, I felt confident at a 60th. Um, if I did like a mirror up, maybe a 30th, but I okay. tried to stay above... 160th or over with that camera just because that's that, pretty low that shutter yeah it, yeah it really kicks around in there yeah, so. and i missed it handheld or tripod handheld, handheld. yeah handheld. yeah yeah tripods i just I, i've got one in the truck if i ever need it in a pinch but i do everything i can to avoid being locked down to a tripod <laughs> yeah i can feel that okay so you have been shooting film for a while now since since when um, I was in high school when I bought, I had a, um, a family member had gotten me a little Kodak, like easy share, mm -hmm. one of the early digital cameras. Um, and I just, once I fell in love with it, I was like, I need something where I can control everything. I want to learn everything. Um, and so I bought my Minolta XGM when I was 15 or 16. So almost 20 years ago when I bought that camera. So, you know, you've been shooting it since early 2000s then mm -hmm. roughly yeah, yeah. And, mid 2000s uh, and you know i know you shoot digital as well mm -hmm. but over the years you've continued to come back to film um t for your books for weddings in the past for various yeah. work different things like that of uh, what is it about film for you this two part that makes you come back to it um and then also what would your encouragement be for uh, people that are considering it or are digital photographers who are considering it or just young people who are shooting with their phone and want to give it a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, any of the times where I would be shooting a lot of digital stuff, uh, you know, for work scenarios, weddings, portraits, corporate kind of stuff. Um, even then I would still always be shooting film 
mostly in my free time. I would use film on like wedding days and things like that as well. Usually a hybrid. Um, there were only a couple instances where it was a wedding or something entirely on film. Um, but usually I would always be shooting film for something, but I'll kind of go through different seasons where like, I like changing things up, um, whether it be cameras or whatever. Um, but there's just an aspect of it that feels, I don't want to, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word real because that makes it seem like, you know, I'm completely discounting anything digital because I, I use digital and I print photos from digital all the time. Um, but for instance, for a book, uh, the idea of working on a book project or something digitally, uh, like I recently went out, started a new project, went out with a digital camera, made a couple of pictures and for whatever reason, the more I thought about it, I was like, I kind of want to reshoot this and shoot it on film and just lean more on that. If I'm going to be dedicating a lot of time to this. And I don't know if it's the discipline of film where it does. I'm much more particular, um, with digital. It's easy for me to just sort of, I guess, get sloppy where I'm like, eh, I can shoot as much as I want and, uh, you know, I can tweak things in post pretty easily. Mm. Um, but for whatever reason, I just, I don't know. There's something about the, the actual process of film where I don't think about any of that at all. And, uh, yeah, I think it's just the discipline and learning photography on film. There's like a nostalgic sort of, you know, almost sentimental type thing to where it's like, I just love that process. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it, honestly, is just the discipline and the cameras are just way more fun. So, well, Matt, your, your commitment to film is pretty clear. If you look at your tattoos, <laughs> yeah, I've got a few on there. No, no SD cards on here. <laughs> These, yeah. <laughs> yeah. None of those. You lose a bet, you gotta get it. <laughs> get it. Yeah. Hey, Trev. So yeah. speaking of film, the, we got a really great question in the chat. Hey, hi chat, by the way. Uh, oh hey everybody! We, we, yeah, we've been we've been like <laughs> popping in and out. We uh, this, there's a storm. We're we're doing our best with it. But uh, lots of folks from all over saying their high hellos. Really great question uh, came from uh, Lucas. Wanted to know what's everybody currently shooting. So I think it'd be kind of cool. Like oh, yeah. that's perfect. Let, let's go around the next question. Yeah, oh, let's nice. go around and just talk about what everybody's shooting. Yeah, for sure. Most of the time, the Leica M6, I've had this for uh, about 11 years now. I had been shooting for, I think, close to 10 years when I bought this camera. It's really the one camera that I've owned that I haven't sold. Uh, I've owned certain cameras where it's like I've owned three different, that, that one camera three different times because mm -hmm. I'll sell it and move to something else and bounce around. Uh, but this is like the one camera that it's my favorite camera to use and it's just the one that, uh, no matter what I'm doing, I'll, I'll bring it with me. But, um, that's what I shoot with now. Before that though, I started with a Minolta XGM. So when I really found that love for photography and I wanted to just control everything and learn, um, I just typed on eBay 35 millimeter camera and the XGM with a 50 millimeter F 1.4 was like 45, 50 bucks. And that's the kind of money I had at the time. And I was like, yep, I'll start with that. And that was all I shot with for a few years. And now my son shoots with it and it's starting to not work as well, but you know, still, still kind of in there. So I would say, so the camera I'm shooting with is a Nikon FM three a, which is my favorite camera. Uh, it's fully mechanical up to a four thousandth of a second, but still also fully, uh, automatic if you want to shoot it on aperture priority, which I love. Favorite focal length and favorite lens is a 40 millimeter. It's like the perfect mix of 50 and 35. It's not as wide as a 35. It's not as tight as a 50. I, I just like it. Um, and then my affordable recommendation would be a Canon Rebel. Yeah. Uh, any, almost any Canon Rebel any can rebel with a flash there are a few that don't have a flash those ones aren't as great because they're not as versatile without that flash the 40 millimeter pancake yeah. you can get for a hundred bucks and it's just as good it's better than this camera yeah. it's better than both of these cameras, yeah, it can do it can yeah um, technically it can do way more good looking <laughs> yeah. um so yeah that would be my recommendation i started on hand-me-down camera from 
uh, Aunt Linda, of course, with the Canon FT, and I've been shooting with it ever since. Uh, awesome. Favorite lens is 50 millimeter, preferably 1.4, but back in those days it was you know 1.8. What I shoot day to day really is based on what project I'm working on at the FPP. Uh, so since January, well, hold down your laughter, uh, I've been shooting with uh, a Kodak Instamatic 100. It's a 126 camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what I've been doing is the FPP offers an adapter. It's a 35 millimeter to 126 adapter. And there's been just a lot of troubleshooting of getting these cameras to work with the adapter because the perfing, perfing on 126 film is different than 35 millimeter. So myself and fellow FPP or Owen McCafferty. Owen's in here in the comments. Oh, hey, Owen. <laughs> we're working on, you know, acquiring unperforated 35 millimeter film and getting it perfed. That's awesome. For 126 so that it works seamlessly in these Instamatic cameras. So since January, I've just been shooting 126 film, uh, 100 ISO film, because that's what these cameras crave. So I've been shooting T-Max 100, uh, Ektar 100, uh, the FPP Color 125. And we're just troubleshooting, and then I'll move on to um, so whatever our next project is, whatever, whatever it might be. So nice. I'm, ever, oh, awesome. I'm always just shooting what we're kind of work, tinkering with. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Mike, I really feel like we're just back to square one. It's, it's <laughs> 2009, 2010 again, and you've come all the way back full circle. Um, but it's a little bit switched because I'm not farting around with like medium format and weird format cameras. I've got, I've got the mania. Can you hand me what I'm shooting on here? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is what I'm back to. I'm back nice. to my uh, Polaroid SLR 680. This was uh, gifted to me from the one and only Leslie Lazenby of FPP Acclaim. And I love this. I I've got the mania. It's, uh, it's not pack film, you know, and it never yeah. will be. But it's, it's, uh, it's so cool. So, of, of course, I like large formats like my thing. It's, I usually shoot cameras bigger than my hair. Uh, but then... I don't know. This is just so like convenient, you know. Um, I always get caught off though because these are built obviously for like ten shots, and you always get eight. eight and I always take my best shot At when it says one. two, <laughs> two or one, and it never, it never fails. Like every single freaking time. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like a father with many children trying to pick their favorite. <laughs> uh, I do tend to sleep around, I guess, because <laughs> so far this year, the only thing I've got right. up until today has been my Mamiya 7. So I've shot probably 30, 40 rolls for the first quarter, exclusively forcing myself to use that camera. And I've just been enjoying the heck out of it and loving the images. Uh, Today I'm packing a Fuji Class Y. Uh, it's got a nice 2.8 lens, loaded with uh, Portrait 400, great for events and indoor shooting. And then for the photo walk tomorrow, I'll be carrying my Hasselblad X Pan, which is probably my favorite of favorites. Uh, so yeah, I have uh, a lot of cameras, and I love them all. It becomes a very personal personal thing. It's not just about the images. There's, uh, there's a lot more to it. It's, these are, film cameras are elegant devices that uh, deserve to be handled and used. If I quick, quickly add, you're absolutely right about the personal. So the whole, you know, rally around 126 or our rally around regular 8mm uh, movie film, it has more to do with that these cameras belong to the grandparents of the folks that are emailing us yeah. and they're like hey i own i have my grandparents brownie mm -hmm. and they want to shoot images mm -hmm. in it or a hand-me-down camera or someone's purchased their, their first film camera and that becomes their go-to no, a legacy camera yeah. for mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. yeah i started out with a uh, kodak instamatic 110 when i was in about sixth or seventh grade and it was a great little camera and then in Junior high, between junior high and high school, I moved up to my dad's Minolta SRT 101 that uh, came back from Vietnam nice. from my uncle and shot that for quite a few years. And then when I got a job in a photo lab that also had a camera store, I bought a Nikon 
FM2, or I'm sorry, F2AS that I still have today, that I'll have tomorrow, that uh, I've run tens of thousands of rolls of film through it probably. And you like wide-angle lenses too. I do. As, as a former architectural photographer, uh, I love wide angles. Um, the lens of choice for me was either a 24 millimeter, 20 millimeter, or probably my favorite, the 28 perspective control, which I'll have tomorrow. Oh, nice. Awesome. Um, really quick, we're... This is what's great about live TV. This is classic live TV, everyone. <laughs> so like, this always right. happens. We've gotten, thank you everyone, all the comments about, Phil's mic is not working. Oh no. It's not working at all. We did that on purpose. So, so, you guys so, are gonna, we'll so we're, we're sharing. Yes. Yeah. Live TV! No matter where you go, no matter what you do, good find your price the fun when they come home with you. Save your fun in pictures, cause fun's more fun when you do. If you are not already taking lots of indoor pictures, why not get started this week? Tomorrow, get some flash bulbs and several rolls of Kodak film. Save your fun in pictures, cause fun's more fun when you do. Remember, your surest way to better pictures is to insist on the name Kodak. Yes. Okay, so the next section is going to be for the FPP crew. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> so, you guys have been around since 2009, 15 years in October, right? Yeah. Yeah. I knew that. Matt didn't. I know. Earlier oh, when we were talking about it, so I knew long. more than Matt. So, yeah, you guys have been around for a while, but you didn't start out selling film. You started out as a podcast, right? Yeah. So, in 2009, uh, podcasts were, like, I don't know, a few years old, and my, my background's in broadcasting, so I just... At, at that time, I rediscovered my Canon AE-1 program camera, and I literally just went back into film photography like, like so strongly. I'm like, I really want to kind of go to the top of the hill and shout out, like, hey. And I just got together with my longtime collaborator, John Fideli, and Dwayne Polkew, who's a film photographer, and we just started the podcast. If you go back to the ancient episode one, that I means it's a little awkward. <laughs> It's a little cringy, but, you know, we just started it. And I very much like, Matt, your, your, like a book, your book project or anything, I just disciplined myself to say, I'm going to do this every two weeks. The show must go on. And I just started it. And then, you know, um, I guess at the time there was a need, so to speak, where, like, you know, people just started emailing and we were doing film Kodachrome giveaways. <laughs> And Mike, uh, how many podcasts now? What what podcast oh, is this? This is episode uh, three twenty. Three twenty. Yeah, three twenty. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the the podcast started, and then folks would communicate with us. Uh, hey, why don't you guys have a store? Why don't you know? So I just started offering film, and it worked. And you started off with, uh, you know, the more like what you still currently sell, the more standard, like Kodak, eventually you got Ilford and stuff like that, but it, you didn't, like, you guys still currently sell, you know, Ilford, Cine Still, Lomo Film, and, you know, I'll throw it in there, you guys have literally the best prices oh, online. Thank you. Something that people uh, kind of overlook or don't talk about as much is your own film line. So when did you, which we have all laid out right here. So when did you start your own film and, uh, what was the, f like, yeah, when did you start it and why? It all comes down to my background in, in cinematography and shooting movies. Gossin Luna Pro F. Like these days, anything we sell that's an FPP film, like I can go in the dark room and feel the emulsion in the dark and know what it is. So it's like, I just have a fascination and love for film. So I just realized that, you know, my favorite company in the whole world, Eastman Kodak, uh, second in line would be the darkroom.com, by the way, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, had a technical 
they had a catalog that's filled with all sorts of just numbers like like some stocks like you know Eastman 2369 like this is a series of numbers this also goes for Sfema in the Ukraine mm -hmm. a series of technical films that are designed for surveillance cameras or uh, uh, industrial use uh, scientific use that were not available to film photographers so what I did, and I still do to, to this day, is, uh, you know, I, I'm a sleuth. You know, we're all, we all put our sleuth hat on, find the films, and then myself, Matt Mirage, and the rest of the, the, the FPP gang will roll it down to spools, and we'll literally send it to everyone and be like, let's find a starting point. Like, you know, we'll shoot it at ISO uh, uh, 2, 4, 6, 12, 24, 50, 100. 200, 400, 800, and then we'll get those tests back and see like what ISO it is for you know pictorial use. I would like to say, and I really feel this way, that I still feel FPP is sort of like the velvet underground of film. <laughs> We're underground, like there are so many folks who don't, still don't even know that we are on the planet. But, so what we're doing is finding these films and making them available to folks to shoot in their still camera. Oftentimes when we post about various FPP film, we'll get comments and be like, it's just rebranded yeah. film. And that's not necessarily the case because a vast majority of this film that you have laid out here, you cannot get anywhere else. There are many other ones here like the Svenmo line, the, uh, the Rev Pan, a lot of your monster film, you cannot buy anywhere other right. than at your store, correct? There are, I guess, start by saying there are very, very few films that are, there's almost no rebrands. Everything, including the Svema. Svema films, uh, they, you can see them occasionally on the Astrum brand. That's mm -hmm. the company in Ukraine. But generally speaking, Svema is still under the radar. We're the only... Um, Met the only finisher of Svema films with a you know with a DX code in packaging, uh, and it's consistently available. I I've been telling Matt because I know Matt likes HP five. You know like the Derev pan what you were talking about. In my opinion, I kind I'm it's not exactly the same, but it's in the realm of like a Triax. There's a little bit more contrast, but it's not it. Um, and then I always talk about the the Svema film has lower contrast with kind of bloomier highlights. Yes. Which reminds me of tri I, or uh, HP5. I thought of Matt where I'm like, if Matt ever wanted to change it up or try something a little bit different because Ilford film is so controlled in their highlights. It's such a, just, it has control in the shadows and the highlights and everything where this film looks like it, resembles it, but has little bloomier highlights, yes. a little bit more character kind in my opinion. Kind of opinion. a glow to it. Yeah, so it's kind of a fun change of pace, which I view a lot of your film as like a fun change of pace yeah. from like the standard. And the other thing that's really cool to think about is like a lot of times people think Triac or Kodak and HP5, or I mean uh, Kodak and Ilford as, but like you guys are literally putting out original film. Like you might not be making it, Right, but you can't get it anywhere else, which is, I think is really cool and something that's not pointed out enough. We're we're sleuths and miners. We wear a miner <laughs> hat. Uh, I mean, th when you talk about this famous film, also, you know, you you can't compare it. Maybe in look, you can compare it to other films, but I mean, it's on a polyester base. You know, it's really thin. It's Thank wafer you. thin. It's only a wafer thin. It's so thin, <laughs> like it could scare people. Yeah, you know, and uh, I don't want to scare anyone, but the results. Except with the monster film. Exactly, <laughs> but the results are uh, so good that you know we've continued to carry them. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. So uh, since we started this, we've had a lot more people roll into the comments. We're like we've been well over sixty people. There's a lot of folks that are just jumping into the stream, and there's a lot of great questions. Can we like drop a yeah. couple questions? Yeah, in? For okay, sure. awesome. So first big question. Who the heck is everybody here? We normally do this in the podcast. So I'm going to jump the camera around just like real quick, just like a hi. And all right, so we're going to go. We're, we're just going to start clockwise again. Yeah, my name's Matt Day. I'm from Chillicothe, Ohio, and I take photos. Cool. <laughs> my name is Trev Lee. I'm with The Dark Room, and uh, I do the social media, uh, marketing, site stuff, these events and whatnot. And that's what we're here for is a big event here in Columbus, Ohio. 
You guys know me. <laughs> My name is Michael Rosso. I'm the founder of the FPP. Uh, Matt Mirage. I was a super fanboy of the FPP for the first year, and I kind of just kept pushing and pushing, and they let me in, and I, <laughs> I haven't left since, so it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I'm Phil Stebley from San Clemente, uh, one of the co-founders of The Dark Room. And I'm Keith Swan, the other co-founder of The Dark Room, and uh, glad to be here. Uh, Mike, another really, really great question that we just got in, and I think could be another like possible roundtable thing, but I think talking about FPP's story and the films that underpin it, um, where does everybody see, just like real quick, do, where does everybody see film photography five, ten years from now? It's kind of like the, oh, like the, the long-term question. <clears throat> You want me to start? Sure. <laughs> you, you start this yeah. one. Uh, okay. Here's the thing, guys and gals. AI. Okay? <laughs> it's coming. I've been, I've been saying, I've been referencing Terminator 3 forever. Talk to the hand. <laughs> it's coming. And what it's coming for is film. And when I say that, I mean cameras that will be built, AI, that will replicate your favorite stocks. Ooh. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to go ahead and sort of disagree with you there. Yeah, I somewhat disagree. Okay. And my my take on the AI thing is, because I've heard people talk about that, is it will cannibalize digital. But digital is, in my opinion, for me, not as fun to shoot with as film. Film is about the act of doing it, a lot of it. Like, I always joke around, like, when people ask me why I shoot film, um, my uh, I've had people that know nothing about film ask it, and I'm like, it's like driving Highway 1 in a Tesla is digital, and driving Highway 1 in like a convertible stick shift car that could break down, it's like more of an experience. And you don't get that, you get the end result with AI, but you don't get the action of actually doing it and the act of taking it. So in that sense, I feel like, it, like film has strength there where there's more than just the end result, there's also the act of actually taking the photo. And with Phil forcing me to do TikTok, yeah. which I didn't want to do. <laughs> doing dances. I, yeah, doing dances. On TikTok, I've, been, I've, realized, uh, I've realized that there are so, and we see this in the lab as well, there are so many young photographers getting in and they have all the access in the world to getting you know, their iPhones, they, they have digital stuff, but yet they're still going to disposable cameras, which is, I don't like the word as much, but like a gateway into other things. Like people are like, this is underexposed. And we're like, oh, there's better ways to take photos on film. And we tell them about a Canon Rebel. Trev, I even have another take on, on the, the attraction of film, particularly to young people, and I, I see it as a, as a counterpunch to their digital lives. Everything's become so, so digital, and it, there's, there's a lack of passion behind it. And I think film brings out that, that, uh, that passion somehow. There, I, I feel very optimistic about the future of film. Uh, and not just as an art medium, but as a release and a, a break from the digital world. Yeah, I, I kind of have, I feel the same way about that. I think a lot of people are continuing to jump on every new digital, not just photography, but AI, every advancement in digital technology, uh, people with the, the VR headsets, you know, and, and it's like, there are people who will always gravitate towards the new thing, whatever that may be. But I think specifically photography, it can be such a tactile kind of experience. And the process of it is, it's increasingly becoming more and more different than what people are used to. So, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago, it was not as common as, I, I mean, it, it wasn't the norm just 10 years ago. Nowadays, obviously, there's even more technology that's been created or advanced or whatever. But like you guys are saying, the act of loading up a roll of film is so different than just any other regular thing, a young person. Product. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Where it's like there are going to be people who gravitate towards, you know, the next best thing, path of least resistance. The camera can do everything for me. But... I think there are always going to be people who do see that side of like, no, I want something that's not 
everything automated for me. I want to do something different. Um, and artists and, you know, people who want to explore the process of it, not just getting the end result, you know? Yeah, my my uh, wife, Hannah, said something. She's not a photographer, but she's a writer, which is why I like this. She called when she got, when I started shooting You told film, me about this, yeah. She started shooting film just to try it, and she called it the handwritten letter of photography in a sense of, like, I could email, like, when I lived out of state, I could email my parents telling them how I felt, or I could write a physical letter, put it in the mail, mail it to them, and that was kind of, like, her way of explaining, like, that's what film felt like her, where there was, like, another layer to it. More meaning, yeah. Yeah. Not that well, you can't have meaning with digital. Right, right. But there, I feel like, because I don't want people to think that we're just bashing digital, that you can't have that. Mm -mm. But I think there's just something that film kind of forces you to have to do. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. we actually still process film for the National Park Service. And they require some of their programs to still be shot on 4x5 film for the longevity. And right. they require you know, X amount of cleanliness, make sure our film is archivally processed. Right. And... If they're still asking for things to be shot on actual film and held in their archives, then I think that that says quite a bit for the the longevity yeah. of film versus that's a good point. digital. Yeah, j just the the longevity of it and uh, archivability. Because I've had hard drives crash and you know things happen. I've got I've found drives where it was a ten step process just to get the actual drive itself to transfer to something that's, you know, used today. Whereas when I put everything on that hard drive, mm -hmm. it was a completely different file transfer process. Right. And so backups are important. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to send clients, you know, their, their digital files on a CD and I haven't had a CD drive on a computer and I don't know how many years now. So it's the fact that it's real and in front of you, that goes a long way. Hey Matt, do you know what they use for, archival off-site backups in a lot of places what do they use, they use tape tape yeah kind of like it's almost like a vhs tape it's oh, called yeah. lto oh yeah yeah and it's it's just a hop skip and a jump from film so it like yeah we the more we the more we push forward the more we kind of go back to like the need the, for the physical the physical media like yeah. it's so, to some degree it 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 ebbs and it flows and i think that's where a lot of people are anxious and they're asking questions, but they're also trying new things. And I think what's really cool about a time like this is it brings out, it brings out that creativity. Like I see people just getting into film that have these like just really, really cool ideas and they wouldn't have, have done that if there wasn't all this other like external pressure that makes them feel like, oh, maybe this is going away or I have to do something that isn't something you can just throw into a prompt. Yeah. So it... It, it generates some cool creativity at the same time that it pushes people and there's scares and right. stuff. Yeah. Matt, that, that is uh, a topic for the future. The, the fact that t tape is used to back up Yeah, we're doing digital. some MVP topics. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. interesting. We'll be right back right after this quick message. Two with extra cream, no sugar. Three with sugar, no cream. One with cream and just a teeny little bit of sugar. One with All that cream and sugar hides something in coffee, and it just might be the bitter taste of caffeine. Caffeine tastes bitter. Well, decaf has nothing to hide. It's decaffeinated. Caffeine's bitter taste is gone. Buy a jar of decaf. Hey, we're back. Wow. Oh, but by the way, really quick, I just want to let you guys know at the dark room that, you know, I'm an adjunct professor. When I teach my class, I was like, you know, Googling stuff like ISO, film my ISOs. Do you, do you know how many times I came up with your blogs? Mm. So many. Yeah, it was perfect. They're, they're great, great blogs. Oh, we try to be a, a resource for all, all things film, yeah. really, with our film index that uh, we try to list all current yeah. films. We, we need to add some of your giant stock yeah. here. I was in the class. Look, I'm like, oh, I need some more information about oh, how to tell these students about ISO and whatnot. And boom, I found the blog. You know, get the get the digital projector out, projecting the website to everybody. Okay, so here, blah, 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 blah. Well, Mike, thanks for commenting on that because it's, it's uh, something we set out many years ago with Trev to make sure that we were a resource for education, for learning. Absolutely. For Many of you, if you follow the dark room, 
you see me because I'm, you know, on social media, on Instagram, and uh, but there's a large team that makes the dark room function, work, and everything. And Phil and Keith are the co-founders, and they're kind of they are the brains behind the operation that's like leading everything. I know Keith, you're a little more on the technical end, where uh, Phil. You do technical as well, but a little more of oversee of everything. Mm -hmm. And go in a little bit more. And I also want Keith and you guys to talk about, since you've been in lab business over 40 years each, um, mm -hmm. to talk about how you've brought a traditional dip and dunk lab into the modern era because we are a traditional dip and dunk lab, but also we have a, we've modernized a lot mm -hmm. of it. Well, although we, Phil and I both look pretty young, we've, we've in, in combination, have, have been in the lab business over 100 years yeah. between the two of us. So him for 80 and me for 20. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost even. Several of our processors are what are called dip and dunk processors. This was always been and has been the, the premier way to process film. And what that means is nothing touches the film during process it doesn't it's not going through any rollers but it's just being dipped in each tank it's lifted up moves forward comes down lifts up moves forward goes down and it's agitated by either nitrogen or air that provides for even development and it's a great way to process now our dip and dunk processors were made in the 90s there's no dip and dunk processors currently being made. So we made the decision about three years ago to start on a project to upgrade our machines. They had computers in them from the 90s, and we realized that should something happen to these electronics that control these machines, we would be, well, we'd be up a creek. So we found uh, a guy to help us and we've modernized these pieces of equipment with modern industrial machine controls that will help future-proof these things for the coming future. Uh, we're happy with the way it turned out. Uh, productivity is high, and we, we think we'll be set for the next uh, 50 years, at least. That's awesome. Now, everything we do comes in analog film, but it leaves the lab digitally. And I know we, we kind of play down the digital, the whole digital thing. But the reality is, it's, it's how we communicate now. And by uploading everyone's images to, to our website and being able to access it on the web, on the Darkroom's app, it makes it's the best of both worlds. Then when the negatives are returned to the customer, they have those to, uh, to archive there at home. No, that's a great explanation, Keith. And I mean, there's a lot more to the, the technical world that Keith primarily spends his days in uh, a myriad of, of issues and problems and things to be solved. Uh, it takes it takes a village. Believe me, uh, we have quite a team of people behind Keith, helping to support in various specialty areas. Uh, so, yeah, the digital world is very real and it's very important to us, and it helps us deliver these images uh, to our customers. In addition to the film that we mail out later. Uh, but yeah, my my role. Uh, I kind of look at myself as the lab Sherpa, uh, just trying to help out and support the team. How have you seen the film community change and grow? How does it look different now? Because when I first started eight years ago, uh, like there weren't that many meetups. You guys were doing some, but I feel like th there's a whole different community because of social media, because of this resurgence. But I don't have that perspective because I wasn't, I mean, I was born in late 80s. So talk about that and how you guys have seen that grow. Mike and I were reminiscing that, you know, back in the day, it wasn't about a community. It was the only way you could get pictures. <laughs> so there was no big affiliation or commonality between people other than maybe a, a camera store, camera club, something like that, real localized. 
Uh, but I think FPP has really led the way in in broadening the reach and allowing us to access and become, I mean, many people know Matt only from social media, and he, I've seen him meet people like in Atlanta last, uh, last October, where you have been you've been friends with somebody for 10 years and you met them for coffee for the first time. So yeah. it's, you know, the, the digital world is an amazing complement to what we do and it brings a lot to the table. And I think that has allowed us to not only promote these types of meetups, but to make people feel more a, a part of a community than, you know, you'd otherwise be able to experience. The meetups that I've been to, um, you know, California, Last year, we went down to Atlanta for film stock. Uh, anything like that is the most I'm ever around photographers in general, film or digital. Like uh, nowadays, I have a few friends uh, that live, you know, in town and in general, just a few friends. In, just in general, <laughs> yeah. yeah, only a few people. But, you know, nowadays, I'll occasionally get together with them. And mostly it's just a reason to catch up and walk around. We don't really go out with the intent of taking pictures as much, but being in meetups like that, it's always like shocking to me because I'm used to not having that around me at all times. And even communicating to people through like YouTube, it's like I'm seeing a camera and I'm seeing comments from people. And that's really where 99% of the interaction lives. So when we were in Atlanta, when we were in San Clemente, all of that, it's overwhelming to me in a, in a positive way, but it's like there are so many people out there that. Otherwise well, the meet the meetups do stoke the enthusiasm. There's no question. Yeah. We all leave these things is maybe more enthusiastic than yeah. other attendees. I mean, it's it really does. Exhausted. Yeah, <laughs> exhausted, but it's in such a great way. You yeah. know, yeah. it keeps us pushing forward. It was great talking with all of you guys. Thanks for having me uh, guest host it. It was. Oh, yeah. uh, it went smoother than more smoothly. <laughs> and uh, I messed it up there. You're, uh, you're killing it. Keep going. <laughs> than I thought. I was a little nervous. You're murdering it, you mean. <laughs> let's, let's, let's definitely do it again. Yeah. If you folks out there listening or watching, if you like this, then leave more comments. Uh, send us an email. Let us know what you think. And uh, we'll try to make this happen. I'll go out to New Jersey. Yeah. yeah. Don't think I haven't already thought of it. <laughs> and thank you, yeah. Matt and Matt and Mike and Keith <laughs> and Trev. Uh, great job. Uh, appreciate everybody. Yeah, all thank you guys for having there. me. Yeah. Appreciate it. And we're going to Hofbrau House. Yeah. <laughs> Hofbrau. Talk to the hand. Takis. And there he is. With a PH. With a PH. Oh, actually, I'm going to keep my hand in on this. Stay okay. Right there. If I cannot shake too much. All right. Nice. <laughs> nice.